So what is it that you want to do when you grow up? O que você pretende fazer quando crescer? You're probably asking why Brazil and why Ouro Preto. My husband and I um, were offered and took jobs at the Universidade Federal de Ouro Preto, which is in a charming UNESCO patrimony city high in the mountains in Minas Gerais. How that came together is a long and convoluted story, which I'm going to condense into 10 minutes. So bear with me, fasten your seat belts. If I could um, ask for some harp music, we would probably do that now. Because this story begins long ago in a time that we now refer to as BG. You know what that is? It's before Google. <laughs> When people actually went to libraries to find information <laughs> in three or four year old encyclopedias. And we were just fine with that. I can tell where the old people are in the audience. <laughs> So my then son's mother and I, who, um, we, we were offered jobs at the American School in Guatemala, and so I went to the library, and we found information about, oh, useful stuff about coffee and banana production, and the history of the Mayan people, and pictures of, of happy Mayan people at festivals, and jungle-covered ruins, and a story about the bustling capital city we, we were going to be working in. So we took the job. Well, None of that prepared us for the civil unrest that we were about to encounter. And I can say that two years later, we had become weirdly accustomed to things like, oh, minor earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, bouts of amoebic dysentery. I was fabulous when I came home. Um, uh, blackouts and uh, shootouts and martial law. Interesting enough, all of that came in really handy when years later I bought a house here in Sacramento. <laughs> And while I was in Guatemala, I began at a very annoying question I asked children. What is it that you want to do when you grow up? The children would say, no sé. And they were coming from a place of I don't know because they really didn't have any dreams at that time. And seeing how they had just survived a major earthquake and numerous attempts at genocide by the United States-supported military dictatorship, I kind of got to understand where they were coming from. But every once in a while, I came in contact with a no say that came from contentment. And this contentment was something that was it's still very meaningful to me because people were absolutely happy to be doing what they were, their fathers and their grandfathers were doing for hundreds of years. And like many people in this room, I come from a culture of discontentment. You know what I mean? We're programmed to need and want and know more. We're talking about our technology. You've got to have it more and faster and all that stuff. And they're okay. That's amazing. So after our time in Guatemala, we went back to graduate school in, in uh, New Mexico. I continued master's research in Patsun Chimatenango, um, was a consultant for Apple de Mexico in Puebla. Um, we divorced. I came out. I got a job here at California State Sa University, Sacramento, which at that time was called that, not Sacramento State. And I retired after 23 years. Looking good, huh? So my first trip to um, Brazil, that's me losing my marbles. So, um, my first trip to uh, Brazil was about 1992. Things I noticed were changing in Latin America. And I'm asking the kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? And suddenly I heard, eu quero ser, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an architect, a math professor. Well, actually, I never heard anybody say that. But. And maybe that's why I keep asking. It could happen, right? <laughs> so you can see this, this gradual change going on. So I came back. Milton um, followed me back from Brazil. He, had a, he got a master's. And we started to think, well, you know, this is so expensive to remain legal, and we don't have any rights here, but Brazil does. And so we began to make plans for, to move back. And while I was in, um, I, I was a visiting professor in Oro Preto, And while I was there, about halfway through the San Juan Unified School District, if there's anybody here from there, thank you very much, um, offered to sponsor him for his, his permanent visa. Well, this changed everything. <laughs> this changed everything. This gave us time. This gave us time for him to uh, work on his doctorate. And during this time, California had its brief moment of enlightenment. 
And what we found out was that because of this marriage certificate, I should have brought that, um, I could immigrate as his husband to Brazil, something that was impossible for us here. How we found that out, um, when it came, came time for us to apply for our positions in, in Brazil, you have to take all these certificates to the consulate and they have to stamp everything. And so the lady who was helping us, oh, I'm so sorry, this one has to go to the embassy in Washington. This one you have to send to Houston. We can do this one, you can do this one. She got to the wedding um, license. She, Un minuto, por favor. She came back in the room. Daniel, this means that you can, you can immigrate to Brazil. And all of us were crying. It was just astonishing. Interesting enough, when I came back in 2011 to get my permanent visa, I should show it to you, it's pretty cool. It's a big card like this. And um, when I picked up my visa, the whole consular staff stood up and applauded. <laughs> That's never going to happen. <laughs> That's never going to happen in any United States consulate for any binational gay and lesbian couple, at least for the time being. I don't even think that happens for straight couples, actually, at this. <laughs> Why do preto? We have jobs in, in a program called um, long-distance education. And this is really, I, I won't say it's the whole reason why millions are in the street, but there's two things that happen about this thing happening in the streets. Um, one is, when President Obama came to Brazil, he signed an accord with uh, President Rousseff, and they began a huge exchange of students between the two countries. And this has expanded to other countries, just not the United States. So we have thousands of students going back and forth, and the Brazilians are coming home and saying, we want to do this, how can we don't do that? Okay? And another one is, is this long-distance education program. President Lula um, quadrupled the size of the university system. Okay? Um, and Brazil is in this change. It's coming out of this terrible nightmare that, had, that in, included, amongst many things, a thousand percent inflation um, and the U.S. supported military dictatorship with all its stupidities and inequities, and it still echoes along there. But now, um, but now there's university education is, is universal and free. If you can get in, you have to pass the exams, right? Um, universal health care, it's not so good. That's why they're in the streets. Um, voting is obligatory. Everybody has to vote. If you want to apply for the university, you want to stay in the university, you want to teach in the university, if you want to be an employee, a, a public employee, a public teacher, even to get a passport, you have to show that you voted in the last couple of elections. It's tremendous. I think we should do this. And as part of this free education we've built, well, I haven't, but now I'm helping build, um, we have one of the largest programs in the country. We've got 30 polos in three states. Polos are educational centers where people come um, who do not have access to technology, so there's computer labs, there's tutorial help, there's a library built, being built, um, and um, there's video conferencing, so I can talk to the students back and forth and they can send stuff to me and complaints, right? <laughs> so I'm, the, I'm now that professor I had with a heavy accent. It's me. They think our accent's sexy, which I find really weird. Because <laughs> I think their accent's really damn hot, so... They're just, fun. They're just doing that for their grade, but it works. So we're giving access to higher education to people that have never, ever had access before. And it's just amazing. Our polos are, are, like I said, we have got well over 30 of them now. They are in former quilombos, which are, are towns or villages that were formed by escaped slaves 100, 100 or so years ago. Some are on Indian reservations. Some are in just rural towns like Grass Valley or Weed, you know. Um, others are in suburbs of Sao Paulo or, or Salvador. And some are in favelas. So we have this tremendous diversity in it. And, and I, I don't have a picture of it, but at one of our last um, uh, recent graduations near Salvador, I asked uh, a nine-year-old girl, daughter of one of my students, okay, what do you pretend to do when you 
she looked up at me and put her finger right at my nose. She says, Vou ser um médico. I'm going to be a doctor. Amazing. In my entire career of teaching for 35 years, I've never had the privilege of seeing the physical difference in my students and communities and the echo in their children like this. It's really tremendous. This is my bus stop. I live behind that church. Can you believe that? You know, they, they said, why don't you live in, in Belo Horizonte? I, said, well, I would leave Sacramento and not live here? Are you nuts? You know? um, so, at a recent, another graduation in a town where we have had um, a huge discovery of gas and oil. In fact, a couple of my visits I was asking my students' husbands, what about the fracking going on? Because there's all these people in hazmat suits and cables being wound, and boom, things go like this. Oh, this is going to be great for the water. Um, but they made a huge discovery of gas and oil. And normally when this happens anywhere in the world, you have this huge tsunami of people that come to a town or from outside who don't understand what's going on, and the locals are relegated to menial jobs. But I happened to be walking with the mayor and the um, school superintendent from the graduation to this restaurant. Look at that place. Look at that place. Look at that place. If it wasn't for Ufope and Long Distance Ed, we wouldn't have the confidence or the tools. Your students are opening that restaurant. Your students opened that store and that store. That hotel, those apartments are your students or our students. And so it was then that I realized that I was, um, I, had, I, had, I had achieved my dream. I now knew what I was doing when I grew up. And so I leave you with this question. What is it that you're going to do when you grow up? Thank you very much.